All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am just getting everything fully pulled up here. Um, so this assignment's gonna be different um, in that it's, it's different than what we've been doing for um, most labs in this section of the class, this quarter of the class. Um, it's going to be kind of similar to when we had a bunch, when we, I gave you a bunch of information about a random compound and you had to sort of piece the information together and, you know, your IR could tell you something different than the NMR, which could tell you something different than the molecular formula, right? Remember how we have, when we were trying to figure out how to characterize these different unknowns, um, we basically had to pull different information from different sources. And when we put it all together, we could get a, um, a structure for the entire compound. Um, 2D NMR works very similarly because it, there's a number of different ways we can combine NMR data and each of them are gonna tell us something different. So, when we first did proton NMR and we started getting used to it, we went with, we basically tried to, you could tell almost everything you needed to from a proton NMR if it was the right compound. Um, but some of it got a little bit hazy. We're basically going to look for what are the most obvious connections from each of these different tools rather than using one tool and trying to, trying to extract all, every bit of information from it it's going to be more like an, um, an IR in a lot of ways in that we're looking for a couple key pieces of information from each of these types of scans. Um, and when we put it all together, that'll tell us a lot about the molecule itself. Um, so first we'll go through a brief overview of how 2D NMR works. Um, and so it, if you remember that NMR is, is essentially based on the idea that if you have an odd number of nucleons, then, you, then the nucleus of an atom generates its own magnetic field. And it can be influenced by external magnetic, magnetic fields. If you put a strong enough magnetic field and hold it in the same position, all of these nuclei, nuclei will wind up arranging themselves so that they're pointing the same direction as the, other nucle as the strong nuclear field. Um, and then for NMR, what we would then do is if you then release the, the magnetic field, you can watch what happens as these nuclei sort of flip back or sort of lose their coherence. They, um, coherence would be if they're all pointing the same direction, all their magnetic fields were pointing the same direction. You, we can, we could test it with various wavelengths of light to see what energy made them flip back and forth and use that. That's what actually, that's where all of these um, 1D NMR spectra came from, was this idea that um, getting all the nucleons to line up the same way and then probing them with light, we could say, okay, there is a, there's a nucleus at this energy that um, corresponds to a certain um, uh, amount of energy required to flip it back and forth. And that could tell us something about um, how shielded it was. Um, the integration told us how many we had, uh, how many protons in each signal we had. The number of signals told us the number of different protons we had. Um, the difference with 2D NMR spectroscopy is that we do this twice, basically. We have two dimensions that we're working from. Um, and so the, the way it basically works is we can actually scan in two directions at the same, or in two different frequencies at the same time by basically pulsing with light and then waiting a specific amount of time and then pulsing with light again to see how closely these different interactions um, are in terms of their energy. And what that winds up looking like is, and then we, we then need to process it with a mathematical technique called a Fourier transform, 
which basically allows us to take um, data and turn it into, it basically allows us to take apart waves that are overlapping with each other. If you have two different waves on top of each other that can look like a really chaotic signal, but if you apply a Fourier transform, a Fourier transform basically pulls it out and says, okay, well, that's really a wave with this wavelength laid on top of a wave of a different wavelength. And when you put them together, you get this sort of chaotic looking signal. Um, so we use Fourier transforms a lot in chemistry, especially in, in with these app, um, instruments. Um, and the, the what, what it, we eventually get out the other end is what's known as a COSY spectrum. And so COSY stands for correlation spectroscopy. And correlation spectroscopy basically just shows you what protons are close to each other. So essentially what we do, what we usually see is these we take the two the spectra and we sort of lay them on top of each other where we basically have the same NMR spectrum on both of these axes. Um, so we can see what the 1D NMR spectrum looks like. And these dots in the middle are what are actually going to tell us how everything works together. And so the what we wind up seeing is that there's some some of this data winds up not being all that useful. So let's let's look at this molecule um, N N prime dimethyl ethylene diamine would be the IUPAC name, something like that. Um, what's what we're really interested in is we're looking at where are the protons, where are the H plus or the um, hydrogens in this molecule and we wind up seeing that you've got protons in a few places there's really only going to be three distinct protons in this molecule uh, and might as well color code these so that's what's on the next yeah there we go um when we look at these we can tell where these different hydrogens are. So this in the middle, that's probably salt or off to the left, that's um, probably solvent or impurity or something. We're ignoring that. Um, we could assign each of these, if we knew this was structure and we knew that these were the peaks we were looking at, we look, can look at the integration, which is the red numbers at the bottom. And we can look at um, the shielding and we can tell more or less where, where the different um, hydrogens are um, and, and assign peaks here. Where COSY really comes into play here is when we do a COSY spectrum, anything that shows up here tells us that there are, there are hydrogens that are either, they're coupled to other hydrogens. And coupled in this case just means that they're um, they're connected, that they're energetically, they're similar, um, and that in this case, it's physically, they are close to each other on the molecule. So essentially, if, if something shows up in this cozy spectrum, it means that we have an interaction between protons. And anything that shows up directly on this diagonal is basically the protons coupling with themselves. We could drop a dotted line down and over. We can see that it's the same frequency as that um, as that uh, hydrogens that we labeled A before. Anything that shows up directly on this diagonal is not useful to us really. It's basically just telling us, hey, these protons are coupled with each other, with themselves, I mean which we already knew because by definition, any protons are going to couple to themselves because they have the same exact energy signal. So, but occasionally, if you have hydrogens that are close to each other that are not identical to each other, we wind up with things showing up in what's called the off diagonal 
And so let me show you what that looks like. Um, and so we, we usually draw the one dimensional spectrum on here so that we can do things like drop down a, di or a, a vertical line or a horizontal line to see, oh, this signal, that's the, that's the same, um, must be the same protons as A that we already assigned. Right, so that we use this in conjunction with the one dimensional NMR. And so we can see C connects with C, which makes sense. These protons, they are, they are the same signal. They will always show up as being the same signal. B, the protons for B don't really show up at all, mostly just because it's attached to a nitrogen, not a, high, a carbon. And the nitrogens and oxygens, their protons don't always show up strongly. Anything on that, like I mentioned though, anything on the diagonal is means that, that the protons are coupling to themselves. And so it's not telling us anything useful. If we get, so in, for this particular molecule, the only hydrogens that are close enough to another hydrogen that would show up as coupling are actually identical. The ones that I circled in red are identical to each other. They're all going to show up in the same signal as C. So if we take something that's, if we take the same formula and we rearrange it, so we put both of the methyl groups on the same nitrogen here, now all of a sudden, this carbon that has hydrogens is going to show up differently than the carbon with hydrogens right next to it. Excuse me. Um, and so we should get more signals because we have the methyls here. We have the CH2 group there. We have the CH2 group there. And then we have the nitrogens, which again, these ones aren't necessarily going to show up the same way, but we do have, we definitely have four distinct types of protons on this molecule compared to the only the three on, that we had before. And we could go through from the proton NMR and we could look at this and say, okay, well, the ones that are, um, you know, that have the integration of three, that's gonna be, that's, we have the most protons that are on those methyl groups, right? We have six protons that are in the blue methyl groups. So this peak right here, is probably going to be the ones that I circled in blue. The ones that are red and orange and pink, there's there two protons for each of those signals. So they should show up all about the same integration. But we could look at them and say, okay, well, this little peak down at the bottom, that doesn't look like it's got any splitting. It shows up much more spread out. That's probably the nitrogen ones, the nitrogen hydrogens which means these other two are the red and the orange, the two peaks that are a little bit further to the left. And we could look at these and, and we could say, well, well, they're both directly attached to a nitrogen. How do we know exactly which of these are going to be more shielded or de-shielded? And that's part of what we're going to see here is that we're gonna be able to assign this a little bit better. Um, so this is the zoomed in version so that we can actually see a little bit more details. B and C, B is a little bit more de-shielded because that nitrogen um, for A doesn't have the methyls attached. So there's less electron density around B. And this is, again, we could have determined all of this ourselves just from the regular proton NMR and had a pretty good idea that we were looking at the right molecule. When we attach this to um, a two-dimensional spectrum, the two-dimensional spectrum initially is going to look like this before the diagonal is drawn on there. <clears throat> 
And what you'll notice though, is that there are two sections that don't show up on the diagonal. Anything that's not on the diagonal tells us that those are peaks that must be right next to it. Those are protons that must be close to each other. So again, A is not really showing up here because A is hydrogens are attached to, the, to a nitrogen. And D is only showing up as this little section right here. There's nothing else in the same row as D or the same height, X and Y coordinates as D. If D, if the, the protons that are responsible for the signal on D, if those were next to another carbon that had hydrogens attached, we should see something off of the diagonal. And it will show up off of the diagonal in the position that matches the other carbon's frequency. So what I mean by that is these, these are what are known as cross peaks, the off diagonal peaks, the cross peaks, which will always be symmetrical across the diagonal because we're dealing with things that are, this is two dimensional, but we're scanning the same thing um, on both of these X and Y coordinates. And so this is the zoomed in version. So this is just taking that middle four squares and zooming in on it. And you could put the uh, diagonal back on there. That's not perfect, but that's pretty close. These peaks that are showing up not on the diagonal are the ones telling you what's nearby to everything else. So the fact that we have an off diagonal, we have a cross peak, and it, that cross peak has the same frequency on the x direction as the b protons, and it's got the same frequency on the y direction as the C protons. So that tells us that B and C have to be close together. And it tells us, like, if, we, if we hadn't been able to just look at the structure and say, well, D is clearly the one that is um, off by itself, away from everything else, this allows us to 100% to say, well, it must be B and C must be the peaks that are physically close together because they are the ones that show up with, with these cross peaks, cross signals. So C is correlated with C and B is correlated with B like we would expect. D is correlated with itself. There's our diagonal. So those are the ones we don't really care about. But C correlating with B shows up off of the diagonal, which makes it interesting, which means we can tell that C and B are physically close together on the molecule. Right, and so if we if we expand this and look at a slight even more um, complicated molecule, so this is the same molecule just with an extra carbon in the middle. Looking at this pro at this structure, we can look at these and say, okay, well these ones with all the splitting, we know that these definitely correlate to being these three carbons in the middle, because those three signals that I circled in red kind of circled in red, are the ones that have the splitting. But as far as figuring out which of those carbons goes with which of those signals, it gets a little bit more complicated. So if we wanted to see that, we could look at the cozy structure. And I think it's going to go through and assign the. There's the zoomed in version. 
Um, and yeah. So if we look at the cozy for this signal, once again, we can still tell A, that little tiny peak, that's our nitrogen protons. We can still tell E is going to be those, those methyls because there's no splitting. Um, and the off diagonals are the ones that are going to tell us what's close to everything else. So the fact that this signal right here, C, has two off diagonals means that whatever, whatever protons are responsible for C have to also be physically close to two other carbons that have protons. So in other words, this tells us that C, that, that this signal that's right at 1.6 something is the signal that's, that is responsible for the, or that is uh, associated with that middle carbon. Because the ones on either edge, on either side of that, the one I circled in blue at the top is only next door to one other carbon that has protons. So it should only have one off diagonal. And same over here. Switch colors. The one I circled in green is only next door to one other carbon that has protons. So that signal should only have one other off diagonal. So by looking at this and seeing how, just how many signals you have, that's going to give us a lot of information as to um, which carbons, which protons are responsible for which signals. And if we looked in more detail, we kept this going. So actually, I'll try to be consistent with the uh, colors uh, of the letters there. We can tell just by the shape of the peak and the fact that it's not showing up on the, the cozy spectrum at all that the NH2 is the is the blue peak and we can tell now that the <clears throat> the hydrogens that have no off off diagonal interactions must be the must be the methyls. And let's see, we have pink there, and we have purple and red. No, I already used the red. We have green. So this signal here, the green one, has one off diagonal. And the purple has one off diagonal. That tells us that these two signals, B and D, must be these two carbons. Now we don't necessarily know which of which is which, but we know that we've assigned we can assign everything except for B and D just by looking at the number of off diagonals. Yeah.
Um, so this again is the zoomed in version of that middle section that we care the most about. And that, that makes it really easy to see. There's, there is our carbon that's right in the middle that has two off diagonals. All right, so bullet point, what COSY shows you is that when you compare it to the 1D NMR spectrum, it shows you which of these signals in the 1D NMR spectrum are must be physically close together on the same molecule, right? And you're looking for the off diagonal signals and you just draw a box. Anything that shows up on that box, that tells you this signal and this signal must be related to each other. They must be physically close together. And this signal and this signal must be physically close together. Right? And that's, that's really as far as we take COSY, generally speaking. We don't, don't try to do too much with this. It's it's best used to supplement the 1D NMR so that you can 100% say this, this peak goes with that carbon on the structure that I drew. Um, there are some other ways we can do 2D NMR. So this was using the same frequency on both axes to allow us to look at the proton, <laughs> excuse me, protons coupling with other protons. However, if you change the frequency between the X and the Y, um, you can get what's known as heteronuclear single quantum coherence spectroscopy, HSQC. And this allows us to take a carbon NMR and a proton NMR and say this proton NMR signal goes with that carbon NMR signal. So it works in a very similar way, except that now we're, we have something different on the X and the Y axes. So it's not about the diagonal, it's about anything that shows up. Anything that shows up is gonna tell us which carbon NMR signals match with which proton NMR signals. And what that looks like, so if we looked at this atom again, we've, or this molecule, if we took the um, carbon-13 NMR, and a lot of times carbon-13 NMR are more likely to have impurities show up. Anything that's not labeled at the top, it's, assume it's, a, it's an impurity for this lab um, because we're dealing with real, real data here and sometimes impurities show up. You can't get rid of things like acetone in your signal or something like that. Um, so assume that if, if it's an important signal, it's labeled with a, with the frequency at the top. So if we looked at this molecule, we have three different types of, actually we have, yeah, three different types of protons of hydrogens, but only two types of carbons. A and C are the only types of carbons that would show up on a carbon-13 NMR. So just by looking at, the, at our HSQC spectrum will allow us to very clearly say, okay, on my proton NMR, the proton NMR signal that doesn't have a matching carbon NMR signal tells us that must be the nitrogens. That must be the proton associated with the nitrogen because the nitrogens will never show up on a carbon-13 NMR. Um, and here's just a, a quick review of one of the variations of carbon-13 NMR was that DEPT NMR. 
which basically allowed us, and, and the, these slides are pretty good at reminding you, okay, DEPT, -E that's really telling you if it's a CH or a CH3, then, it, then the um, peak goes upward. If it's a CH2, the peak points downward. And so this is a this is a form of 2D NMR, but we don't need to look at it as X's and Y's. We basically just need to look at it as up and down. So, so these DEPT scans are going to tell us whether we've got CH3s or CH2s. So in this case, with this simple of a molecule, this is all we need to assign everything because we can look at this and say, okay, well, that's a CH3, right? Which means in a DEPT scan that the signal should be pointed upward. And on the flip side, the pink carbon, is that's a CH2. So in this type of scan, that should point downward. So in this case, this is all we really need to assign which peaks go with which carbons. But as we get to more complicated molecules, that's not always going to be enough. Um, and so the other piece of information we can look at here is the HSQC. So the HSQC, again, if you look at the, the PPM on the axes, that'll tell you which is which. Up at the top, is your proton NMR. And along the side is your carbon-13 NMR. And so right off the bat, we can look at this and say, OK, well, This signal from the proton NMR matches up with this signal on the carbon NMR. That tells us that those two signals match up. And that allows us to say 100%, oh, well, if you know the proton NMR, if I can say, oh, well, C is clearly this, um, this proton signal. And then we, that allows us to tie our carbon NMR signals to our proton NMR signals. So, and actually, in terms of the the order of the materials that we just or that we're looking at here, so let me clear these. Go back one. We we're able to say that the one at fifty one fifty four was our pink carbon, and thirty six sixty. 51, 54 is the pink, and the blue is at 36, 60. Yeah. That's not what, that's what I meant. So now when we go to the next slide, we can look at this, this and say, okay, well, here's our carbon NMR on the left-hand side. 5154 was our pink. And I mixed up my colors again. And 3660 was our blue. So that allows us to then turn around and say, OK, well, the dot that shows up at 3660 must have the same x coordinate as the protons responsible for it. So this allows us to basically translate from proton NMR to carbon NMR or, or vice versa. This is basically a function that allows us to take our data from carbon NMR and turn it into and, and assign the peaks to proton NMR without even having to think about it. As we were able to do the carbon NMR really, really easily for this molecule, right? Because it was a simple molecule which means all we have to do to, to assign the peaks for the proton NMR is look at the HSQC. It allows us to do a one-to-one -one connection 
between the carbon NMR and the proton NMR. The pink carbon showed up at 5154. Therefore, the signal that matches that on the carbon NMR is the one that goes with that, with those hydrogens. And the signal that shows up that doesn't match whatsoever, that has nothing, our purple signal on the proton NMR has no carbons associated with it. The fact that there are no carbons associated with peak B tells us that's the nitrogen peak, that protons that are associated with the nitrogen. All right, so I should probably keep a running tally on the board behind me. And I know you guys can't really read the board, but we'll use it as a summary at the end. Ozzy told us, what protons are coupled. Uh, Sean, I have a quick question. Yeah. Um, what, what about the, the thick, like multiple lines on the carbon NMR that's just around like 78 or? That was the ones, let me, Clear the annotations here. Um, that was the one that was not labeled on our carbon NMR. Um, so that's that's right. impurity. Oh, okay, okay. All right. So, and we'll we'll see that show up again here in a second. Let me just finish writing our cheat sheet here. So DEPT. Give us the CH, CH3 point upward and CH2 points downward. And we've got HSQC, which compares protons to carbon. Hmm. All right, and the the report sheet for this lab does a pretty good job of reminding you for each of the sections what that type of spectrum is telling you, but it's still good to have a, you know, a one sentence description of what you're looking for for each of these. So here's another example where we start with the carbon 13 NMR and same thing here we see that the um, this really strong peak that's showing up at the same place every time, that must be corresponding to their solvent. Uh, based on where it's showing up, maybe they're using benzene as their solvent. Um, regardless, if it's not labeled at the top, we're just going to ignore it. So, if we're if we're able to use a carbon 13 NMR to uh, to assign each of these peaks A, B, C, and D, we have four different kinds of protons. We know that A, A is not going to show up here at all. So B, C, and D are what we're looking at. And now we're getting into a slightly more complicated molecule where just looking at the DEPT is not enough to tell us everything, right? Because we do have one positive signal, so 45, 68 is going to be our green um, carbons because that's the only carbon that has a CH3. B and C have CH2. So they both are going to show up as being negative. So we can't necessarily distinguish B and C, although we could look at the shielding um, 
So, but initially, all we can tell is that D, the carbons associated with, with these methyl groups is at 46, 40, 68, 45, 68. If we then turn around and look at the HSQC, we can look at it and say, okay, well, where's my carbon that's at 40, 46? And we can see that this peak right here is our green peak, right? Again, if we just had the proton NMR, we probably could have figured that out too, just based on the splitting. But remember, splitting is not always reliable. So it's always good to have something, especially something that we can look at and sit with 100% certain certainty and say, smoking gun, absolutely, that peak must be um, the carbon D. And these others, we can look at them and say, well, I know these other two, B and C, are these here and here, and they must match up with these. Again, we could look at the splitting and determine that. Or we could look at the integration. Um, and again, we can look at it also and say, okay, well, there's a little bit of coupling in two different places here. So what do we do with that? But generally you're gonna be able to look at these and say pretty, that there's one that's a much stronger correlation. So we still don't know what B and C are necessarily just looking at this, but we definitely know that this peak and this peak are matched. And this, these two are matched. Because if you just look at how big the, the dots are there, how strong that signal is, that'll tell you those are the ones that are really closely connected with each other. And if we zoom in a little bit further, we can look at this and, and um, get more detail. And again, we can look at the shielding here. B must be more shielded. Or sorry, more de-shielded because it's directly next to a nitrogen with no methyls. And C is going to be more shielded on the proton NMR. Right, so using these together allows us, is what allows us to put everything together and say, okay, well, that peak, that peak that was the furthest downfield, the furthest to the left on the carbon NMR is associated with this, uh, with peak C on the proton NMR. All right, what does this look like in practice? And we'll do, an, we'll do some more um, with this, but just so that, I, so that you guys get an idea of how we're using this is basically you're gonna get two molecules and you're gonna have to go through all of these spectra for both of these molecules. And just like we're doing here, I'm, you're not starting from nothing in this case, trying to figure out a structure. We're just trying to make sure we can map a fairly complicated looking molecule to all of the appropriate peaks on each of these different types of NMR. So we're gonna use all of these different types of NMR to determine this. And so first things first, anytime you get a new molecule, you look at the proton NMR and it's gonna have you look at the integration. Um, 
for the different signals and it you basically you're going to be given a list of chemical shifts because that's how we identify which peak we're talking about and then um and then you're going to have all of the spectrum the spectra for these and so you're going to basically go through this spectra and say okay this is peak a this is peak b based and what based on what you can determine here but you won't be able to determine everything you can when you do your assignment for these peaks say well i don't know 100 percent, but it's it's one of these three options um for instance we've got three peaks here for this molecule that are all that are all in the six six and a half to seven range those are going to be our um aromatic protons right that was that the ones that show up in that region are always aromatic but we might not have enough information to be able to tell if we're talking about we could look up here and still not know if we're talking about C, D, or F. So when we were trying to fill these in, you might start by just write, writing in C, D, and F. And then you're get, you can come back later and cross things out as you may use process of elimination and some of these other spectra. Right, so you're basically keeping a list of what's possible at each of these points. Um, and we're not going to worry about coupling constant. Don't worry about coupling constant at this point. Um, we're just not going to go into that. Um, all right, but. And then once you, you're done looking at the proton NMR for a specific molecule, it has you look at the COSY spectrum. And again, matching up these chemical shifts to which things have those off diagonal correlations. And then does that allow you to take what you wrote down up above and get more specific? And then it has you look at the carbon 13 NMR again, and go through this, what are the possibilities for each of these? And so each time you add a new spectrum, you want it to be consistent with what you figured out above. Right? The whole idea is that gradually, you're gonna start with a bunch of possibilities for these, for all of these spectra, and gradually you're gonna eliminate possibilities until you know for certain this proton goes with this signal on the proton NMR. And this carbon that doesn't have any protons must go with that signal on the carbon 13 NMR. All right, so that's the, going to be the whole process here. And so this is, the write-up is 10 pages for this one, but it's just 10 pages of these tables where you're trying to put all of this information together and, and assimilate it and interpret it in a way that allows you to assign, make these assignments for each of these, right? And then, so it has you do it for this molecule, this dimethylphenol, and then it has you do it for ditertbutylphenol, and do the same thing. So you're only doing this for two different molecules for your write-up for this lab. So, um, none of these are do i expect you to go through just with one piece of information you kind of want to be kind of broad with what's possible with these like i don't know if i could if i could decide one way or the other so i'm going to write down both possibilities and then when you put that together with what you decide from the next one you can then say okay well the only the only letter that matches up with both of these two different spectrum is A, therefore this peak must be carbon A. And that's the whole idea is that we give a bunch of different possibilities from a bunch of different sources. We sort of Venn diagram it. Whatever's right at the middle is the one that satisfies spectrum A and then satisfies spectrum B simultaneously. <laughs> 
Right? That's that's the approach with these. <coughs> Excuse me. So are we right. <clears throat> are we gonna actually be given the um, actual NMR diagram or just the? Yes. Yeah. So your your um report sheet is just the, these tables that you go through, but then there's another PDF file on the assignment that is that is all of the spectra and pretty much in the same order that you that it calls for in the in the procedure. So you can basically you're going to want both of them open. Um, okay. or, and you might even, you know, there's, there's 26 pages of spectra. Um, so you might not want to print all of those off, but it might not be a bad idea to print off the report sheet if you have access to a printer so that you can go through it with pencil and sort of mark things up. Um, I would definitely not print out all 26 pages of this. Um, yeah, I would just right. keep it open so you can go back and forth and reference it. Um, see oh that's all that hsqc and it's, they've got stuff zoomed in so pay attention to what you're looking up at at the top the labels that tell you what you're looking at would be helpful too um and i believe that that means we only have really one more one more type of spectrum only I've, we've only added four new types of spectrum today um, to go along with your regular carbon 13s and your proton NMRs that you 100% remember really well, right? Um, so, but let, first let's go through the carbon 13, 13 NMR for this molecule again. So now we have three carbons in the middle. B, e, C, and D are in the middle. We've got A, which is our nitrogen protons. We've got E, which is our methyl protons. <clears throat> if we want to go through this and assign some of these, remember, we can't trust the integration on carbon-13 NMR. We mostly going to be based on um, shielding, but it still might not be entirely obvious. But what we could use is the DEPT. We've got the A is not going to show up at all in DEPT. B, C, and D are all CH2s. So B, C, and D are possibilities for these three. So again, if we were writing in, in our report sheet here, we could write in that we have signals at these for these carbon signals at four different places. We carbon signals at 5758, 4072, and 3174. And just based on this initial one, we can't really assign any of them. However, when we look at the DEPT, one of them is different than the others. That tells us right off the bat, the one that's pointing upward is our methyls. And that was the one that's gonna be around 45. So we definitely know that that is E. As far as the rest of them, all we really know is that these others could be B, C, or D each, for each of them. And so this is what I mean about don't try to do too much. Beyond a shadow of a doubt, if we have the DEPT, we can identify one of these two or one of these, these four. And then we just leave it at that. We go to the next type of spectrum and see if it tells us anything different that allows us to mix and match our information. <clears throat> 
then if we look at if we compare this to the um, if we compare this to the HSQC, say well we already we got E we know that E is right there. But if we look at the rest of the at the proton NMR, the proton NMR we maybe we were able to assign at the very least we could assign A. And B, C, and D all still kind of look close to another, one another, but we know that B is going to be the most de-shielded. So that tells us, that allows us to go through and sort of make our map. I said eraser. Um, we can say, okay, well, I know B then goes with this signal. And then I know C, my most shielded, has to be the one that's right in the middle. And that's going to go along with this top signal. Right? So using the proton NMR, which we are more practiced with, and this HSQC allows us to assign all the peaks for the carbon NMR. <clears throat> And my color coding is not all that helpful when our colors are all on top of each other. Um, but it definitely still matches. And it, we definitely can allow a, this to translate from proton NMR to carbon-13 NMR. Sometimes the carbon-13 NMR is easier to read and make conclusions from. And so you will use this to go from a carbon-13 and assign peaks for the protons. Sometimes the proton NMR is easier to read and assign peaks. And so you use this to go from proton to the carbon 13. Right? It's basically like you like a translator, though. It allows us to go back and forth and assign peaks. If we know anything from one of them, we can assign the other peak that goes with it. And that's just the zoomed in version so that I did, wouldn't have had to draw on top of it, it so quite so much. All right, so here's our last one, our last new type of scan of spectrum. It's called heteronuclear multiple bond coherence spectroscopy. So HMBC. And HMBC is really interesting that it, it basically only shows correlations between protons and carbons that are two or three bonds apart. So it's basically found a way to subtract off the correlations that are only one bond and only look at things that are two to three bonds apart. Which again gets kind of tricky. But what it shows us is that, and it's again, it's going to have your, your proton NMR on the top and your carbon on NMR on the side. It tells us that this carbon has two different types of hydrogens that are two bonds away, two or three bonds away. which again, seems really vague and not all that useful until we start using it in conjunction with everything else. So going back to one of our, our simple molecules we've used as an example, if we look at the protons that are attached to carbon A. If we look at two bonds away from that hydrogen and three bonds away from that hydrogen, that's going to tell us what is close, how many things are, are attached 
two or three bonds away. Right, so you usually we will draw in the hydrogen so we can count the bonds more easily. So if we're looking at prot the protons that are on A, we go not one bond away, but then two bonds is a nitrogen and three bonds away is another carbon. So the proton attached to, to carbon A only has one carbon that is two or three bonds away. Two bonds away is a nitrogen, so nothing will show up. Three bonds away is a carbon. All right, so again, this is the trickiest one to use by far because it, it's two or three bonds away and you have to sit down and count the bonds, but this is, can be really useful if you've assigned some of the peaks, but not all of them. So that tells us this carbon is going to show up on the HMBC for this hydrogen. And because it's a carbon that is two to three bonds away from a hydrogen. Again, I know that's really tricky to wrap your head around. If we look at that hydrogen and consider, okay, so that's the hydrogen that's associated with, um, that's in the carbon, on the carbon C, on that, the carbon in the middle there. We can look at that and say, okay, well, if we look at it, if we count two and three bonds in any direction, one, two, or two, there's a carbon that should show up. If you go two bonds the other direction, you get a nitrogen that won't show up. And then three, you get another carbon. So that carbon should show up. You go three, the other direction, you get a nitrogen. Nitrogens don't show up. So this tells us that this proton has, should have two possible signals. It is two or three bonds away from two distant, different carbons we do in fact see that there are two signals in that column. And again, for the most part, you're, you're kind of going to want to use this HMBC as sort of a last ditch effort. It's, it's gonna be your final tool to, to assign things. You wanna try everything else first because this one's gonna be the trickiest to actually tell anything useful from. But if you can get some of your, most of your other peaks assigned and you only have a couple of possibilities left, this can be helpful between distinguishing a couple of possibilities. Usually you can get almost all the way there um, just from, from the others we've looked at. 
All right, so I'm just filling this in. It maps protons to carbons that are two to three bonds away. Um, Sean, if you move from that, uh, the C carbons, hydrogen, like we just did, and then if you move to the right, it's it's two bonds away, and if you move to the left, it's three bonds. Is there any indication of like because it's two bonds away, it'll show something different than if it's three bonds away? No, and that's one of the trickiest things about this is that it shows up the same whether it's two bonds or three bonds away. Okay. Um. Okay. So when we get for these small molecules, nothing is that far away from each other. But for some of these larger molecules, um, this will wind up being useful because if you can't tell, you know, if you've got seven carbons, a chain that's seven carbons long, and you know that well, the, the, there's these two signals in the middle, and you don't know which is which, but you know one of them is three carbons away from the methyl at the end of the chain. And so therefore it should show up. But the other one is four carbons away from the methyl at the end of the chain. Therefore it won't show up. Oh, okay, all right. So it kind of doesn't give you that much information, but like if you're stuck somewhere, then it will give you like a little nudge to get there. Okay. Exactly, it can be a tipping point. Okay. Right, so there's some more practices, these ones wind up being more complicated looking as well, <laughs> because you can have a whole bunch of, if you look at D for this example, uh, the car carbon D is two to three bonds away from a bunch of different hydrogens. So carbon D should have, should show up with signals for that hydrogen, there's one, two, and then three to the hydrogen. It should show up with a signal to those hydrogens and those hydrogens. So, so a lot of times you'll wind up with multiple possibilities here. Um, and you wind up with very complicated looking um, spectra as a result of that. Actually, yeah. So for, for the proton on carbon B, the signal show up only at C because one bond to two bonds gives you a carbon, one bond, two bond gives you a nitrogen and the hydrogens won't show up with each other. So it's not showing hydrogens linked to other hydrogens. It'll show hydrogens linked to carbons or carbons linked to hydrogens, but not carbon to carbon in this case, and not hydrogen to hydrogen. So instance, this is the one that we wanna see. So one bond takes you to the first carbon, that won't show up. Two takes you to a nitrogen, that won't show up. Three bonds takes you to a carbon, takes you to a methyl carbon. Three bonds in the other direction takes you to the second carbon here. So these are the two signals that are showing up in column D. The protons from D should have two signals showing up. Carbon, it's a it's a little trickier to 
a sign if you start from the carbon and count towards the hydrogens. Two, three, one, two, three. And, and like you, like I mentioned, seeing all of these possibilities, all the different ways that they can be linked together is tricky sometimes. So if we look at B here and count one, two in either direction, well, two in this direction, that's a carbon. So that should show up. You go three you get another carbon. So that's another signal that should show up. And generally speaking, you want to go from the proton. You want to start from the proton, not starting from the carbon to a proton. It's more consistent and easier to be um, comprehensive when you're starting from the proton towards the carbons. So the one in the middle, C. Two bonds away, you get a carbon. Two bonds with the other direction, you get a carbon. Three bonds in either direction, you get a nitrogen. Nothing shows up. One on D, one step. Two takes you to a nitrogen, nothing. Two the other direction takes you to a carbon. That should show up. Three takes you to another carbon. That should show up. Three the other direction takes you to another carbon. Those, are, those two are identical to each other, so that should show up as one signal. So these three signals are all two to three bonds away from the protons or from the protons on carbon D. Right. And so and you. If you try to look horizontally, if you try to, to assign it to start from, say, the, to do this row, if you try and do it starting from the carbon, you can wind up with things showing up as being coupled um, that are not as easy to see, that are not as easy to assign. Um, the protons are the ones that work really consistently with this. So you start, you, you start from a proton signal and look downward as opposed to starting from a carbon signal and looking sideways. All right, so the last examples here. So without looking at any of the assigned stuff so far, we can look at this and say, okay, if we're looking here at two bonds, we hit a nitrogen that won't show up. Three bonds, we hit a carbon. Three bonds, we hit a carbon. So we would expect that this hydrogen signal will have two carbon signals directly below it. And that is what we see. OK? Hmm. Again. I know that these ones are the trickiest. Use it as your final, I won't say your last ditch. Um, and that's why that these, these ones have the most complicated pages for HMBC because you're going to, for all of the proton signals, you're gonna look at it and say, okay, for that proton, what carbons are gonna show up two, three, um, away and write down the, the number for the peak for each of the ones that should show up away and whether or not you know what that carbon is or not. And so it's basically just going to be a, a comprehensive, go through all the possibilities, what will show up and um, is that something that you still need to specify what's possible. I think that there, there are a couple of carbons in this assignment where you have to use the HMBC to, to finalize your assignments to get it right. For the, but it's 
the bulk of the work will be done by the time you get here. All right, let me make sure that that's everything. So Proton NMR, we know how to use those, right? Even though if it requires a bit of review. Proton NMR, the pieces of information we're looking at are number of signals, integration, shielding, I'm just going to write it over the top here, number of signals, integration, You can look at peak splitting, but it's not always reliable, especially if there's atoms like oxygen and nitrogen involved. And shielding. Most electron withdrawing means most deshielding means furthest to the left. All right, and carbon NMR, we can't use integration, but we can't, or uh, peak splitting, but we can look at the number of signals and the shielding. Those were our basic 1D NMRs. Then we can look at DEPT, we can look at COSY, we can look at HSQC, and we put all of it together, we can assign, we can 100% say, these are the two peaks that are responsible that are caused by this carbon and the hydrogens attached to it. That's the ultimate goal for this assignment is to be able to fill out this page. There's a peak at 694. Which of these letters, which of the protons asso associated to the um, carbons with these letters is responsible for that particular signal. And then same down here. Filling these in so that you only have one letter for each of these. That's the ultimate goal for all of these. And that allows us to, to know that we have characterized and um, interpreted the NMR correctly. If you have all of this information for these molecules, there is only one possible way to do this, to make it to satisfy everything. It's going to take some practice trying to use these. right? And that's what these tables are for, to try and organize your thoughts for you. All right. So I know this is the type of, of introduction where I can say questions now, but until you get into the thick of it, you're not really going to know what questions to ask. Um, but I'll ask it anyway. Do you get, does anybody have any questions so far? All right. Then I'll go ahead and turn you loose on this. Remember, a coupling constant. Um, if you are interested in this, in the coupling constant, what that means, um, I will. I'll find a good um, resource that you can use to, to look at. It basically has to do with um, how wide the peak splitting is. And that'll tell you, that tells you something about how close the other protons nearby are. Um, it's not necessary for this assignment, um, but I will put a resource with the, uh, with the um, assignment on Canvas. Um, but you don't need to fill that out for this assignment. All right, well, I'll let you start working on it. I'll still be here. Let me know if you um, come up against any questions. And I will post a video of this as well. Um, actually, you know what we can do is I'll stop.